we, we are very honored to welcome you on the stage today. And as you see, there are many youth who are joining us right now in this room. And also, I would like to say hello to um, the audience who are joining us um, right now from all over ASEAN. And we are having over 200 people joining us right now online, in the Zoom only. And we're having live on three pages as well. So today is going to be a very dynamic discussion indeed. No? So again, welcome uh, to the site uh, of American Center Pat Tadam. And um, first of all, I think we received many questions from the youth, but today we have chosen some um, outstanding question to ask the uh, Deputy Secretary. Let me also start with the first question. No. So the first question is from Diane Gabuni from the Philippines. No, she's not here today, probably joining from the Zoom. As a leader, how do you manage the generation gap between senior leader and younger uh, generations? First of all. Uh, but first of all, uh, before answering to this question, uh, probably you may give yeah give uh, an opening remarks and then uh, answer to the question. Sure. So um, I am thrilled to be here with you all. Thank you for studying music. Um, I know young people can listen to music and have a conversation at the same time, but when you get to my age, it gets harder. Um, just give you warning: you have years to go before you get to where I am, but it gets harder. Um, it is terrific to be with you all. Um, I travel all over the world and I try to meet with young people everywhere I go. And YCLE is just such a spectacular organization. And the reason it's so important to meet with young people is really the answer to the question you just asked. You are the future. I'm not. My uh, most of my days are behind me, not ahead of me. That's okay. I've ha I'm having a great life, and I'm now Deputy Secretary of State, so I'm still working pretty productively, even in my older age. Um, and I told some folks earlier that when I was um, younger and my daughter was growing up, she thought I was too radical. I was quite a feminist and a great supporter for women's rights in the United States. And she thought I went a little too far sometimes. Now she's grown up. Uh, she teaches uh, immigration and asylum law at a university in uh, the United States. She has two sons of her own. And she is more radical than I am <laughs> uh, because she sees the world differently. It is her time. And so she's pushing me to think about things in a different way. You all live on your telephones. I live on mine, but most of the time I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, you often live on social media. Uh, and although I certainly look at my Twitter account, um, because I'm a government official, I don't do Facebook or anything else. And my Twitter account is not even controlled by me. It's controlled by our public affairs people who ask me for permission, but they sort of tell me what to do. So you live in a different world than I do and a much more exciting one, but a very challenging one, very challenging. What the world will look like as you go forward in your own lives will be very different. Not only because of the internet, but because of quantum computing and artificial intelligence uh, and the digital economy and whether in fact someday cryptocurrency will be as normal as our currency. I don't know the answers to all these questions, but you are the ones who are challenged to answer them. When I taught at the Harvard Kennedy School before I came back into government, my students who were graduate students had two things that were most important to them. And half of them were not from the United States. They were from other parts of the world. 
And when I taught after the pandemic, which was all online, I had someone in Sydney, Australia, who changed her whole schedule. So she got up at noon so she could stay up till three in the morning so she could go to classes. I had someone in the Seychelles who always had birds behind her whenever I taught. So I had people all over the world, someone in Nigeria, someone in Berlin, someone in Sao Paulo. So people from all over the world, but two things, social justice and climate. These were the two big issues. So I will be very interested to hear from you today. What are the issues on your mind? What do you think people like me, who do have some authority as Deputy Secretary of State, not lots, but some, should be thinking about that maybe we're not? And what are you all going to do about whatever it is that's on your mind? If you leave here with nothing else, what I want you to leave here with is power is in your hands. Power for the future is yours. What you do with it is up to you, but you can do an enormous amount. I'm going to stop there. Wow, thank you very much. And already very inspiring not to to start the session today and uh, thank you very much for the very insightful um, answers and I think a lot of youth who are in Laos and also in ASEAN in all around the globe are facing this this problem right now right and I hope it will be useful for all of us to hear that the power to change the world is in our hands indeed no? And um, yeah, to be honest, we have many questions today. And if the time allows, we also open the floor for some more questions here as well. Now, and the second question that we have is from Cambodia. No? Uh, anyone from Cambodia um, joining us on the Zoom? And this question is from Uk Min Ko San. No? Sorry if I uh, pronounce the name not so right. No? So the question is, what is the best way to integrate youth in ASEAN? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'd say first you need to ask ASEAN itself. Um, we are delighted to have a comprehensive strategic partnership now with ASEAN, uh, but we are not a member of ASEAN. Um, President Biden just uh, held a US ASEAN special summit uh, where we heard from ASEAN leaders um, which was a fantastic meeting. I was privileged to be part of it. Um, but I think uh, if ASEAN is not talking with young people in all the ASEAN member countries, um, they should be. Uh, so if they're not, you should urge. Uh, I hope and assume there is an ASEAN youth program of some sort. I really don't know. So if you all know, please tell me. Um, because I think it's terribly important for the future of ASEAN, uh, which we believe is central. Uh, we believe in ASEAN centrality. Uh, we believe ASEAN is a critical, critical regional organization uh, for the future of this part of the world and for the world in general, quite frankly. Thank you. And and we know that um, the um, United States also give a lot of opportunity to the um, youth exchange program, as our special guest has mentioned as well. Thank you for the question from the Philippines and Cambodia. No? And I will take this opportunity to turn into this room. No? So I will receive a question. We received many outstanding questions beforehand, but um, today um, we are going to Antica no? for the first question, please introduce yourself and proceed with your question, please. Uh, Sabadi, my name is Antika Sayaporn. Currently, I'm studying international relations at the Faculty of Law and Political Science, the Uni National University of Laos. And um, I have just been back from the United States like three weeks ago uh, through the UGRAD program. So I was so delighted to be selected for that program. And I also the alumni for Wisely Regional Workshop. I joined this program when I was, um, I think it was 2018. So to keep it short, I would like to go directly to my question. So um, when, when I heard the topic of this discussion, I think of one question that I want to ask you as a woman leader. So I want to know how will you handle the 
unpleasant behavior of someone that does not respect you as a woman leader. Because personally, I have experienced this kind of situation and I want to hear more, like how will you handle it? Thank you so much. There's not a woman in this room who has not been disrespected at some point. Um, because, you know, in most of our societies, including in the United States, historically for a very long time, men had all the power and authority. Uh, when the United States was created, women did not have the right to vote and did not for many decades. It was a big struggle to get the right to vote. And part of the reason was when people have power and authority, they think if they have to share it, that somehow they will have less. They will have less power and authority. And it's important to think of the world not as what we call in English zero sum, somebody wins, somebody else loses, but rather that you can increase the size of the world so that everyone can have a piece of the power in the world. It doesn't mean that men at some point uh, might lose a job because a woman finally gets it. That may happen. That has happened. Uh, in fact, until I became the Deputy Secretary of State uh, about a year ago, no woman had ever gotten that job. So my getting it means all of the guys who thought that job belonged to them didn't get it. But for many years, until 2021, only men got it. <laughs> so that I finally did, I sort of went to say to guys, get over it. <laughs> so we all have to be generous and kind to each other because there are a lot of challenges ahead. And if we work together, we can deal with those challenges. But if we disrespect each other, if we don't value each other, then we will not be able to accomplish what we want to. So for those women who have felt disrespected, and as I've said, there's probably not a woman here who has not experienced that, uh, create a support group for yourself, first with other women, so that they can tell you the truth, whether you were really disrespected or whether you were just thin-skinned. Um, they can help support you in your ambition and what you want to do. They can cheer you on. Also include uh, around you uh, people that I call Galahads. Those guys who remember that they have sisters and mothers and maybe daughters and want them to succeed too. And so they wanna help you succeed. And what we really should be doing is helping each other succeed because then we can take on all of these very difficult challenges. And then the last point I'd make is to everyone here, the women and the men, believe in yourself, have confidence in yourself. There's a very famous Hewlett Packard study that says that when men apply for jobs, if they think they have 60% of the qualifications, they believe they're qualified for the job. Women, on the other hand, believe they have to have 100% of the qualifications or they shouldn't apply. So I say to women, apply if you have 60%, just like the guys do. And you know what the guys do? If they get the job, they define the job as those 60% and forget about the other 40%, or they fake it until they make it. In other words, they start the job until they can learn how to do 100% of it but they have confidence in themselves. So if you have 60% of the qualifications, go for it. Thank you very much, Noel. 
especially the last point i think it's like what everybody's like especially the women are i myself as well you know just be confident with ourselves and thank you um antika as well for a very nice very great question i think uh, women around the globe are facing this uh, similar situation you know? so we also have another questions um from the audience in this room no i would like to introduce uh, i would like to invite korakot no to introduce himself and also to ask your questions, please. Good afternoon. Hi. So my name is Kolakot Ansiri, and I'm a YCLE alumni for Regional Workshop. Um, and I'm currently working with the United Nations Development Program. So thanks uh, for the State Department to give us the opportunity for the Lao youth to go have discover friendship with other uh, friends in ASEAN and also like from the States. Um, my question will be related to Lao PDR. So right now we are making a report about the national human development in Lao. Um, and it's uh, mostly about the youth because 60% of the population in Laos are under 25. And what we found during the process of making this report is that about 40% of the youth are unemployed in Laos which is the highest rate on youth un unemployment in ASEAN. So, and at the same time, we know that about 80,000 youth will uh, come to the job market every year for the, for the next decade. So my question would be uh, how the State Department will further support Laopedia uh, for the youth uh, to get uh, employment. And what recommendation or advice do you have to policymakers or youth here in this room and all around uh, uh, online um, to better prepare for, for the youth future? Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, the fundamental um, responsibility uh, is everyone who lives in this country. So yes, the government has a responsibility to support and help its citizens uh, and to create an economy that creates jobs. Um, that obviously is a high priority for every political system, whether it is the PDR, or whether it's the United States government. Um, President Biden's number one responsibility is to make sure there are enough jobs. And quite frankly, he's done a good job on that. We have a low unemployment rate right now. We do have high inflation. We do have high costs of food. We do have high energy prices. We have lots of problems, but the unemployment rate is quite low now after the recovery from the pandemic. Um, so every government, that is their responsibility, but it's also the responsibility of the citizens uh, to uh, ask of their government uh, for what they need, uh, to uh, be entrepreneurial and innovative. One of the things about young people that's so extraordinary is so many of you create uh, apps, create uh, projects online, create new businesses, uh, create new opportunities through the digital economy, have ideas that never would occur to me. So I would say it's many things. It's holding your government accountable, but it's also being an active citizen in your community uh, to create the fabric and the infrastructure that will create jobs uh, and to use your talent and the opportunities that you're getting, whether it's visiting the United States or visiting another ASEAN country, to be innovative, to be entrepreneurial, uh, to create a business, to think about what you might do uh, to create a job and an income for yourself. Thank you very much, no? such a very insightful um, answer. And thank you, Gargo, for the uh, great question as well. Uh, and I think next is our turn to answer some questions. <laughs> now for the audience here to answer a questions about the deputy secretary, right? Are you ready? And we'll have to um, enter to mint, uh, minty.com, no? So I'll stop, please uh, uh, 
display it on the screen, please. And also this question uh, to test if you know <laughs> that <laughs> the deputy secretary has first job, you know, what it is. You know? So um, in order to join in this activity, go to menti.com and use the code 79885137. No, again, seven, nine, double eight, five, one, three, seven. No? And then you can also type your, your answer. It's a guess. No, no. So that's a, a right answer. But um, if you have a wrong answer, nobody will blame you. <laughs> so please join in. No? What was the um, deputy secretary Sherman's first job? No, a professor. Mm, professors. Mostly they have um, the same answers, no? Teacher assistant, let's see. Lecturer, mm -hmm. not sure, sorry. Ah. <laughs> so we have an insurance, uh, a mom, a barista. <laughs> a real, uh, about real estate. If, uh, that's see, you cool. all are used to doing <laughs> this. This is like, I had to learn this when I was teaching how to do this. Right. Uh, yeah. A librarian, and we also have oh, so so fast. You guys are so great, you no? Know? So we also have the um a, a, a researcher, ah, a social worker. Hmm. Let's see. I think we we have many answers, and we might already have the right answer there. You no. Know? Was this a mom? <laughs> oh, I wasn't a mom for. Uh, quite some years. I wasn't a mom until I was 34. Right. So let's see the, the, the question, the, the answers is still going on. No, we will um, leave for may maybe 10 seconds more. Well, yeah, I'll start counting down five, four, Three, hurry up. <laughs> Two and one. Ah, okay, okay. I think we have the right answer there. No? So the right answer about the first job of Deputy Secretary Sherman is a you want me to answer? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer <laughs> Maybe for that's me. If a you want. Here. Maybe that's not the right <laughs> answer here. So please help me. So um when I finished college. Uh, my first job uh, was as a social worker, but I didn't have a I didn't have a master's in social work yet. Uh, but I was a social worker at a hospital for the chronically and terminally ill. It was a very difficult job. I was just out of college, and I'd go to um, a party, and people would ask what you did, and I said I work with people who are terminally ill, and then they didn't want to have any more conversation with me. So uh, when I got out of graduate school, um, I, I worked for three years between college and graduate school. And then I went to graduate school and I got a master's in social work as a community organizer and as a clinician, uh, both as a therapist as well as a community organizer. And all of the community organizer skills I learned, I have used in every job I've ever had, including the one I have now. Um, but my first job which was a little ridiculous uh, because I was so young. I was the director of child welfare in the state of Maryland. So I worked on adoption, foster care, and institutional care for children. It was a very demanding and a very difficult uh, job, but uh, a real privilege. Thank you. So the right answer was a social worker. Uh, who got it right in this room? Can I see the hand? Oh. <laughs> No? Okay, so um, my, my, my question, my next question follows with this um, um, activity. So um, we would like to ask you, how did your first job as a show, social worker prepare you for what you are doing now as a deputy secretary of state, please? So um, I joke um, that my clinical skills, my staff has heard this line a hundred times now, uh, my clinical skills helped me to deal with dictators and, and members of the United States Congress. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, but my clinical skills actually helped me understand people and have an appreciation 
uh, for what people have to go through in their lives. Uh, it can be very difficult. And so uh, I'm very humble. I, I try to be very humble about what I understand and what I don't about people's lives. Often things are going on in on people's lives that no one knows about, uh, that are very hard and very difficult. And so I try to be humble and I try to be kind and uh, imagine that maybe somebody's gone through a pretty tough time and I just don't know about it. Um, the organizing skills uh, have been critical uh, because when you learn to be a community organizer, you learn to identify what the objective is of the community, uh, how you can bring people together, uh, what the strategy might be to getting to the outcome. And I started in child welfare. Uh, I then moved into politics. I helped people get elected to office. Uh, and then I uh, ended up very strangely because I understood Washington being asked by Warren Christopher, who was going to become Secretary of State uh, for the first term of President Bill Clinton, if I would become the Assistant Secretary of Legislative Affairs and work with the United States Congress around national security and foreign policy issues. And I did that, and I have done national security and foreign policy ever since, but I've gone in and out of government. I um, So the organizing skills worked very well for organizing political campaigns, same set of skills. Uh, then uh, I went into government, used the same set of skills. Um, when I left after the Clinton administration, Madeleine Albright, myself, a couple of other people, four women and a really good guy who could put up for with four women, um, built an international global consulting business. And I did that for several years uh, before going back into government and then ultimately became a professor and then went back into government. Wow, so it's a long journey, you know, but um, here's the living proof that the experience that we gain from when we are a youth, you know, um, will definitely contribute to Absolutely. Yeah, what we are doing right now. Um, even though it's like the high position. Uh, and yeah, I would encourage also the youth in this room and who are joining us uh, right now to, um, you know, go out there and experience the world and gather as many as experiences as possible. No, So that's uh, our questions to you and also to our special guests. And I think we have some time to open the floor for more questions. I think we have time for, for one or two questions from our audience here. Please raise your hand if you if you have any more question for our special guests. Or a comment. Or a comment. No. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a question. How do you all look at the world? Mm. Were you raising your hand? Yeah. Okay, we have a, a question over here, please. Or a comment. Yes. May I have a pose my question? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Zabaydi. So yeah. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, my name is Sai Zai, and yeah, I was a journalist, um, a media consultant, and a designer. And as as you know, uh, this is my question is about the uh, women roles in um in our society. Uh. Uh, one of the topic we are discussing is now is about uh, encouraging women in the leadership positions. Uh, yeah, as we can see, women in the higher positions in the women as a leader is very, it always looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like strong women, only strong women can get there. But for for the woman who is, uh, how can I say, as a, a great supporter and they are not in the higher positions. They are not um, like in the leader positions, but but they are great for the how we can do to make the society uh, admire their values, admire their works at, at the mom as a uh, other, <laughs> and also make themselves value what they're doing, even if they're not uh, leaders. <laughs> I think that is a fantastic question. Um, really, really good. And um, a couple of things I would say. Folks should be very comfortable choosing what role is most comfortable for them. One can make a difference 
in front of the curtain, like I am right now sitting on this stage, but one can make a tremendous contribution behind the curtain. Not everybody has to be out front. Um, and in fact, nobody accomplishes anything alone. Nobody. I could not do what I do if I didn't have a wonderful husband for the last 42 years. I could not do what I do without an amazing team of people with whom I work. So it's never about the leader. <laughs> a leader has to not only have followers, but team members, people who play different roles, but together they get something done. I think we've gotten better at valuing women's choices so that, you know, in, in my day when I was your age, we were more strident in part because people only thought about us as mothers. And so we had to say, no, no, we can do this and we can do this and we can do this. And I do think it led to mothers feeling not as valued. I think we've gotten a better sense of this now that women's choice and feminism for me means you get to make a choice. Whatever choice is good for your life and for what you want to do. And raising a child who then contributes to the world, there is no, for any parent who's sitting here, there is no greater uh, contribution in my book. The thing I am proudest of is that my daughter now challenges me that she is a fierce advocate for uh, work against human trafficking. She supports people who are trying to get asylum and uh, entry into our country immigra in immigration. And that she is raising her two little boys to be kind people. That's to me, uh, I, that's the thing I'm proudest of. So everyone should choose what they want. I had a young woman who was my executive assistant at Harvard. She could do anything. Uh, she was just extraordinary. And she was always um, a bright person, sunshine, without, you know, being too much. She was just a positive person. And um, she and I, at one point, she said to me, I, I want to come to, I said, do you want to come to Washington with me? And she said, I want to come to Washington with you. And I said, do you really? Because she had a boyfriend that she was very close to. He had just moved to Florida. I said, do you really want to come to Washington? Or do you want to be with Tom? And she thought about it. I mean, I really challenged her. I would have loved for her to come. I said, but you understand if you come to Washington, you have no life. You have no life. <laughs> you know, you won't see Tom in Florida. <laughs> you will be in Washington and you will have no life uh, because that's what happens. It's a 24 seven job every day of the week. And she thought about it and she decided what she really wanted to do was move to Florida and be with Tom. It took her a few months to do it, but that's what she did. And that she was more comfortable in business than she was in uh, going to Washington. She thought she had this idea that's what she wanted to do, but then she realized that's not really what she wanted to do. And she's really, I've, we've been in touch since, and she's really happy with the choice that she made. And I'm really proud of her for knowing herself. Right. Thank you very much. Such a very good question from Saitai. No, thank you. And I think it's very lively uh, discussion. I would like to keep going on, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have limited of time. So we will just have the last, last quick questions from, from Indonesia. We have a question from Rizky Harris, and he asked, is it fun to be a DPT secretary? <laughs> so let me ask um if if somebody has a microphone somebody have a microphone okay there are two people back here who work with me every day uh no tawan tron uh, josh rubin who's a senior advisor to me 
and Tawan Tron, who is a special assistant who she doesn't work 24 seven, she works 72 seven. I, I joke that I leave the office and she's still there. And when I get there in the morning, she's already been there. I, we think she sleeps there. So um, you answer this question. Is it fun to be Deputy Secretary of State? Well, all I can say is it's fun to staff the Deputy Secretary of State. <laughs> uh, Tawan, you have to say more than that. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, from my perspective, anyway, I, I, I'm not a deputy secretary of state, so I can't answer uh, on her behalf. But from a staff perspective, um, being able to work for a principal who is so dedicated and focused um, on behalf of our country's mission, um, you feel like every day you come to work and there's so much purpose to everything that you do. So I, I feel very privileged to be able to support her. So thank you, Sean. Kawan is a foreign service officer. Josh, on the other hand, is a short termer. He's a political appointee like me, not a foreign service officer. So Josh, is it I fun? Think, I think the deputy secretary has a lot of fun doing her job. <laughs> Sorry. And the, one of the reasons is an event like this where she's able to travel on behalf of the American people and represent the United States and uh, meet people all around the world, meet government officials, but also meet young people uh, and hear from you and take your feedback and incorporate it into what we get to do every day to try to make the world a better place together. So I think it's a lot of fun for her. Thank you. I, I, will, I will say just a couple of words uh, to really answer the question. Fun is probably not the first word that comes to mind <laughs> in these jobs, but it is important to have some fun. It is important to have fun in your life, uh, to have joy in your life, uh, because the work that we do is hard. It's really hard. Uh, and so uh, we tease each other, as you can see, um, when we're on the road and we try to find uh, some things to laugh about. Uh, each other usually uh, in a really teasing, loving kind of way, not, not in a mean way, uh, which I'm not in favor of at all. Uh, but it is important to have some fun. And we tried to do that. Um, uh, recently, uh, my colleagues, I can't even remember what the occasion was now. At any rate, uh, they had... Um, cupcakes for me and they had put in the cupcakes what was it oh yes it was my one year anniversary as deputy secretary of state and so we had a more we have a morning meeting at nine o'clock every morning with the secretary when he's there when he's not there I run the morning meeting uh, but he was there at this meeting and we walked out and they had cupcakes for everybody in the senior staff but on each cupcake my staff had um done photographs of me or of famous celebrities um, that they knew I liked, or they had several of the cupcakes with different photographs of foxes. And the reason for that is my nickname, which goes back to when I negotiated with Iran, I won't go into the story of why this became my nickname, uh, is Silver Fox. So uh, a lot of the cupcakes had little photographs of silver fox. It was very funny. It was just ex ex hysterical. Uh, the secretary thought it was pretty funny too. Um, so yeah, fun matters a lot. Uh, but more than anything, as uh, Josh and Tawan said, it is a privilege and an honor as it is to work with the ambassador here uh, to get up every day, even on days I just much rather stay in bed. <laughs> uh, it is a privilege and an honor to try to do my best for my country. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Actually, we have the last, last, last question. <laughs> this is the real last question from the audience back home. No, from Monica uh, from Indonesia. What is the right way for young people today to reach a position like you? And this would be the question that closed our session today, please. <laughs> 
don't aspire to be me. Aspire to be your best self, whatever that is, whatever that is, whether it's to be a mom or a dad, whether it's to be, you know, the CEO of a business, whether it's to be a member of a team, um, not the leader, whether it's to be the person who manages the books and makes sure that every penny is spent well, uh, whether it's uh, to be the person who teaches uh, first graders uh, so they can be the best selves they can be, whether it's to be a healthcare provider who helps us get through the horrible pandemic we all have lived through. So just be your best self, whatever that turns out to be. Don't imagine that necessarily what you're doing today is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Your world is much more mobile even than mine was. Uh, and my life changed constantly. So be your best self. Whatever you choose to do, make sure when you get up in the morning, you look forward to working with the people that you will work with if you're working or you love being with the children that you've had because that's the most important thing to get up every day and be happy about the choice you've made. That's not true every day in every moment. There are plenty of moments I'm not happy with the choice I've made or I'm tired. But overall, be your best self. Make sure when you get up in the morning, whatever you decide to do, you're having a good time doing it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the deputy secretary. And I hope you had a fun afternoon <laughs> and, <laughs> and enjoy. Well, thank you very much. And uh, enjoy hearing from the youth from the ASEAN. Sorry, and also the yeah? in this room as well. I can see many hands uh, were there, but uh, since we have a little bit of time, I'm sure that you will get the chance to ask your questions sometimes. In yeah, please. I have a question, so sorry. Oh, I... yeah. Thank you, both. Thank you for a very great job. No. And um, last but not least, I would like to um, welcome everyone to a photo session. <laughs> so we will have a group um, photo together with our special guest back there um, with our backdrop. Please um, join us. And... Um, our session will be um, ending <laughs> very soon after this. Probably we, we help um, to move the chairs a little bit.